Coming up, how scientists are studying and developing 2D materials. Electrons can move faster in this material than any other material known to man. So that means it's like a super highway for electrons. A tool that lets you talk to fireflies. If you start to become more of an advanced firefly communicator and you want to try out other species or look for other things that you're seeing, you see something in the field that doesn't look like what you're doing, then you can reprogram it to have different codes. The driverless car dilemma. There are going to have to be decisions made about whether people down the road will be sanctioned for choosing to drive their own cars when at some point that's going to put other people at greater risk. Funding for this program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, Sue and Edgar Wachenheim III, and contributions to this station. Hi, I'm Mike Zeman. Thanks for watching SciTech Now. Scientists at Penn State are trying to unlock the true potential of some common elements. But to do it, they need to work at the atomic level. Producer Bill Hallman shows us how some very advanced tools are helping advance the research into what is known as 2D materials. Meet Frank. Frank is a furnace. A furnace that heats up to about 2400 degrees Celsius. That's about one third the temperature of the sun. And the J.A. Robinson Research Group at Penn State's Material Research Institute uses it to make something called graphene. Graphene is the first of what's being called 2D materials. They're strong, thin enough to be measured in atoms, and have the potential to change electronics forever. Electrons can move faster in this material than any other material known to man. So that means it's like a super highway for electrons. The speed at which they are able to travel is on the order of about 100 times faster than silicon. The comparison to silicon is important. Right now, silicon is at the core of every computer chip. Those chips use transistors to process the information going into or heading out of your cell phone or computer. Right now, industry giant Intel is using silicon to make a 14 nanometer transistor, the smallest on the market. You can fit about 5,000 of them across the width of a human hair, and each one can send more than 100 billion electronic signals every second. 2D materials could make those transistors even faster. We're hitting the limit of being able to make it smaller and smaller without needing to put in a lot more power and a lot more electricity into it. And so we're actually looking at new materials that could potentially replace silicon so that we can make more powerful or more energy efficient devices. If you're able to do that, then you're able to continue bringing things online, like making, enhancing virtual reality. So you can make, because it takes a huge amount of computing, computation um, uh, effort. But before these materials can be used in electronics, they need to be produced and perfected in the lab. That means using high-tech furnaces like Frank to continually make the materials and high-tech lasers like Lucy to examine them. The things that we're growing are things that we can't see. And so we need to actually identify that what we thought we just made is in fact the thing that we just made. We will shoot laser lights at materials uh, in spectroscopy, and the materials will reflect the laser light coming back to the instrument. This process is called Raman spectroscopy. The light bouncing back is shown by something called a spectra. Scientists use it to determine the quality of the material. If they need a closer look, they use this. The Titan Electron Microscope, a crown jewel of Penn State's Materials Research Institute. It is powerful enough to see individual atoms. That means imperfections, no matter how small, have no place to hide. The process at Penn State is slow. The biggest chip manufacturers can make billions of silicon transistors every second. Members of the Robinson Group are working with a single sample at a time. In order for us to be able to make that amount of volume, um, we basically need to take what we can do with the state of the art tools and science and basically scale it up to industrial levels. And that's not very easy because when you scale something, a process up to that level, there's a lot of things that change. But these scientists believe they're building a solid foundation that'll push 2D materials closer to the mainstream. Graphene research, 2D research at this point is still very much an academic exercise. 
but there are a lot of people, including ourselves here at Penn State, that are really trying to push this so that it goes beyond academia and, and really does make an impact on our everyday life. We know that we're working on something that is next generation technology. So that's really exciting. There are approximately 2,000 known species of fireflies, and each species flashes its own unique code. Interactive designer and nature enthusiast Joey Stein worked with evolutionary biologists to develop the firefly communicator. So a firefly communicator, it looks like something that you hang off your keychain. What does it do? Well, this uh, relatively simple device allows you to communicate with fireflies and bring them right to you. And when you say communicate with, this is because fireflies are what, constantly looking for these signals when they're in mating season? Yes, uh, and the communication signals actually from fireflies have been misunderstood by, by people for centuries. For the most part, fireflies communicate for two reasons. One, to find a mate, and the other to warn potential predators that they are toxic and not good to eat. This device actually allows you to communicate with them as if they're, uh, for their, when they're searching for a mate. How do we know that they uh, can discern what code is their species and what's not, and how do we know so much about them? Scientists have been studying that very thing for, for quite a while now. There are some very interesting things about uh, how they evolved to flash and how they differentiated with their uh, species based on their flash. They began as an aposematic signal, just like wasps and bees with a yellow and black stripe. That's a warning to predators that uh, they have a powerful sting, and in case of fireflies, they're toxic. So all firefly species, their larvae and their eggs glow. Not all firefly adults actually flash. Scientists know that there is, a, that there is some point in time in history, in evolution, where the fireflies started flashing to find each other. And that, they suspect, happened when the advent of flowering plants occurred mm -hmm. and lots of flying predators, including flying insects and birds, came on the scene and the fireflies got pushed to the margins. So they had to start communicating at night. And so that was, that was the big challenge, is how do they actually find a mate? So they started to flash in order to find a mate. So how does this work? You, you just generate small signals with little yeah. lights? So scientists in the field, they use uh, a, a light just like this. Fireflies all emit light in a, a wide variety of wavelengths. Uh, greens and blues and whites all are sensitive to and works with. And what the scientists do is they would just press a, a button like that mm -hmm. uh, and get get an LED flash to go. And one of the scientists I'm working with, Frederick Venchel, he studies the way that the fireflies flash in the field and has taken his best guesses and figured out, cracked these codes. If I walked into Central Park right now and if I saw a firefly, how do I figure out whether I could generate the right kind of light code to lure that firefly? So the small button here is what I call the code button. And this button plays back a code that is based on a known species. Or you can actually design your own code for this and uh, be like a scientist and try and crack a new code for a new species. Each one of these is programmed with the most common species in North America. And that allows you to go out into your backyard and have some success. This device works with a, with a phone, so you can actually make your selection. If you start to become more of an advanced firefly communicator and you want to try out other species or mm -hmm. look for other things that you're seeing, you see something in the field that doesn't look like what you're doing, then you can reprogram it to have different codes. What does the app do? So the app, it allows you to select, uh, to find a firefly based on the color or flash type or the region that you're in. So you're likely to find the right 
species for you can your can narrow animal. down the species. You narrow it down, exactly. Okay, so I kind of know that this is a, it looks like it's a yellowish one or a darker brown one, and I know that I'm in North America, I know I'm in the Northeast. You got it. And then, so now we're going from 2,000 down to 1,000, down to 400, down to 15. Yeah, or even, or even less, right? Because that's the big problem. It's not like a, a bird app where you, I want to look at a blue jay, where you already find that signal. It's much easier for people to know that, but these patterns are not, not ones that, or these species names aren't familiar. So here, too, you can also create a custom pattern. So this, this equips you with a lot of uh, all the signaling parameters that you would want to, to create your own, own signal. So, and then you, once you're satisfied with this, for example, this one, we have um, emitting a green signal. So if I were to take the same signal and I can make it now amber. What was it like the first time you walked around with a biologist and saw that they could lure a firefly with a, a particular light? It's thrilling because it's uh, not anything like I expected. You get different behaviors from the fireflies when you're communicating with them in this way. When you are out catching the fireflies, they will emit a signal, and but a lot of times that's a signal trying to remind you to not eat them, not, not destroy them, not touch them. But when you actually use this device, you get this moment where especially males will come in and they'll dim their signal because they don't want to advertise to other males that there's a female there that they've found and they'll come around and they'll basically be courting you and they'll move around the device a lot of times they'll actually land on the device which is thrilling and then you can pull it right up to you it's it's like not catching a firefly <laughs> all right joey stein thanks so much for joining us thank you With the global spread of Zika, epidemiologists in North Carolina are tracking the evolution and geographic spread of the virus from when it was first identified in 1947 to today. Here's the story. Before 2015, few people had ever heard of the Zika virus. Then news broke of an epidemic in Central and South America. In the vast majority of cases, infection is asymptomatic or brings mild flu-like symptoms. But in the unborn babies of pregnant women, it can cause a severe birth defect called microcephaly. In adults, infection occasionally leads to serious complications and even death. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention estimates that by early 2017, nearly a million people in Puerto Rico will be infected. Cases have started showing up in Florida and experts believe they can multiply rapidly. In central Florida, efforts are underway to reduce the risk. The virus is spread by mosquitoes, so one way of fighting Zika is mosquito control. Right here is almost subtropical. Right here is almost the same weather as in the uh, Caribbean. The weather is, is warm almost all year long. The mosquitoes get a better chance to breathe right here faster than in the northern states. Amador Rodriguez is searching for two species of non-native mosquitoes known to carry Zika. We're looking for water sources. The water sources, that's where the mosquitoes are gonna breathe. That's where the uh, mosquitoes are gonna lay the eggs. That's what they're gonna uh, incubate and hatch. And the main concern is trying to get the people safe. The mosquito will lay the eggs there. When our field inspectors are out looking for sources, they are looking for any little thing possible that can hold water enough to breed mosquitoes. Inspectors collect mosquito larvae and bring them to this Orlando lab to be analyzed. The mosquito female, after it's taken a blood meal, it develops its eggs and it can lay up to 200 eggs per batch. And those mosquito eggs have to dry out for 12 to 24 hours. And then once they get wet, they hatch into little larvae. And the larvae have four parts to their life cycle. It just takes about five days to go through that larval life cycle and then they're off and flying. Officials use data on where the larvae were collected to determine where to spray, being careful not to target harmless local species of mosquitoes that form an important part of the ecosystem. They are pollinators and they're part of the food chain. There's lots of things that eat them as larvae, fish eat them, frogs eat them, any, some other aquatic organisms eat them. But as adults flying around, there's lots of birds that eat them, bats, there's quite a few things that eat them. But some researchers believe sprays are ineffective against the two species that spread Zika. 
These mosquitoes don't swarm at night when spraying usually takes place. Female mosquitoes are the only mosquitoes that bite. Florida International University neurogeneticist Matthew DiGennaro regularly meets members of the public to answer questions about Zika. I'm trying to get pregnant this year, not the best time, obviously. He and other experts believe genetically modifying mosquitoes might be more effective than spraying. One way is to release male mosquitoes which don't bite that will species specifically find the Aedes aegypti female and render her functionally sterile and unable to reproduce. And so we can achieve population reduction through this mechanism. And it has been done in the Caribbean, it has been tried in Brazil. And I think that it's a lot better than spraying, which affects so many different insects. What we need to focus on is reducing just the Aedes aegypti and Albopictus possibly as well, their populations. Another approach is to modify the DNA of mosquitoes to react differently to smells such as a human odor. The first step is to figure out which receptors in the mosquito's brain cause it to be attracted to humans. And then we can try to find a chemical to hijack those receptors and then we can cause a mosquito to be like, oh my God, yuck, stay away. So it would almost be like a designer perfume that is designed to annoy mosquitoes. We think that understanding how a, a repellent works will help us design the next generation of repellents. But techniques like these are likely years from being practical. Meanwhile, officials on the ground know they have to try many options. Especially with these two species, we cannot spray our way out of this because they're so elusive and they're hard to control their habitats and there's little bits of water all over the place. When we do hear about risks in other areas, we're very quick to learn about things that are, are going on and, and what's working to control. While driverless cars are expected to increase efficiency and reduce traffic, they also raise important ethical questions. Reporter Andrea Vasquez discussed some of these questions in a Google Hangout with Shannon Valor, professor of philosophy at Santa Clara University. Shannon Valor, thank you for joining us. Happy to be here. So we're looking at self-driving cars. We're seeing these in our definite future, but there's some ethical issues involved. One way that people look at this is through something called the trolley problem. Can you explain what that is? Sure. So the trolley problem is an old philosophical thought experiment that just used to be used in courses on ethics and moral philosophy as a test of our moral intuitions. And the way it usually went is some variation of the following. You're driving a trolley down a track. There are uh, a number of people trapped in a vehicle or somehow or maybe tied uh, to the tracks by some nefarious person. And the trolley is going to kill those people. But the driver of the trolley has the option of diverting the trolley onto another track where perhaps there is only one person in the way. Uh, perhaps there's a worker on the tracks that will be killed. And the question is, what's the right thing to do? Should you actively cause the death of the one worker by diverting the trolley or allow, let's say, five people to be killed by the trolley on its present track? And the idea is it seems like both have some problems. In the one case, you're actively causing someone to die. In the other case, you're allowing more people to die when you could prevent uh, those deaths and cause only one death. The reason why this has captured people's moral imaginations in the case of driverless cars is that there are some scenarios that seem to come up that might present similar difficulties for programmers of driverless vehicles. Because unlike drivers now who have to make split second decisions and we don't expect them to do a lot of careful moral calculation in those scenarios, these cars are going to be able to anticipate those kinds of scenarios. Programmers are going to have to be able to tell cars in advance how to handle difficult situations. For example, one where let's say that there uh, is a school bus uh, trapped in a tunnel and your car is hurtling towards the tunnel, it detects the fact that there's a school bus, which is presumably full of lots of children, that it is likely to rear end unless it veers off the road. But let's say that there's an almost certainty that if the car veers off the road, it's going to kill you, the occupant. Let's say that there's a cliff 
that the car cannot avoid going over if it veers from the lane. Uh, let's assume that perhaps it'll have to crash into the tunnel wall. So here's a question. What should the car do? Should it rear end the school bus, which might cause the deaths of a number of innocent children? Or should it sacrifice you? Uh, presumably one is better than many, but on the other hand, it's your car. If I spent the money, I want to survive the crash. And then there are worries about the programmers actively causing the car to uh, put it, its occupant at risk versus accepting the risks that are already on the road that the programmers themselves have not chosen. So you can see how the trolley problem kind of gets recreated here. Do the programmers have to anticipate every possible scenario or do, do these cars have the potential to learn? Many of these cars now have self-learning algorithms that are able to be trained to generalize from past driving experience to new situations. So that just like a, a driver might encounter a situation on the road that they've never encountered before, and from past experience make an educated guess about what the right thing to do would be, we now have self-learning artificial neural networks in cars that are being trained to make the same kinds of educated guesses in new driving situations. And in the programming of these prior to, to that self-learning, those decisions that they're making, those premeditated decisions in those scenarios, does that become a company by company standard? Does that become an industry regulation? How do we navigate that? That's all up in the air right now. And that's something that automakers are talking about, legislators are talking about, uh, industry uh, professional associations for uh, computer scientists and software engineers are talking about this because we don't know. Right now, each self-driving technology is being developed more or less independently from the others. And negotiations with uh, municipalities, um, and, uh, uh, and, and regulators is really happening separately. But the conversations are beginning to come together and there have already been a number of efforts to get people who are interested in this technology in the same room to talk about standards. Because down the road, you're going to need those standards. You're going to need a common understanding of what driverless cars can and cannot do, do on the road, a common understanding of what protocols will exist for cars to communicate with one another so that they can identify other driverless cars on the road and perhaps a coordinate action with them. Uh, there's gonna have to be decisions about how insurance is gonna work, how liability for uh, injuries or deaths caused by driverless cars is going to be uh, addressed. There are gonna have to be decisions made about whether people down the road will be sanctioned for choosing to drive their own cars when at some point that's going to put other people at greater risk. The whole reason for this technology is that humans, by and large, are not great drivers. We drive distracted, we drive drunk, we drive tired, and people die as a result. And so the whole goal of this technology is to remove that human risk by allowing automated systems to do the work for us. And this isn't the only place where new tech innovations are creating questions that we didn't know to ask before, um, ethical questions. And how are we learning anything from these conversations that are starting to happen about how to navigate this cross-section of human ethics and technical and artificial intelligence? Absolutely. I mean, I think we are just at the beginning of those conversations, but I'm very much encouraged by the enthusiasm, uh, not just uh, within uh, university researchers uh, and, and research communities, but also uh, from industry and government. The growing understanding that we need to have conversations about the ethics of emerging technologies and AI and automation is one of the biggest ones. Now, what we will learn from them and how much that will really affect uh, design, implementation of artificial uh, intelligence and, and similar technologies, that remains to be seen, but we're heading in a good direction. Shannon Valley, thanks again for joining us. Thank you. You can watch full episodes of SciTech Now On Demand and on WPSU's YouTube channel. I'm Mike Zeman, thanks for watching.
Funding for this program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, Sue and Edgar Wachenheim III, and contributions to this station.